Merry Christmas. Grace and peace to you from First Presbyterian Church of Rolla. Thank you for joining us on this first Sunday of Christmas. Uh, the season of Christmas runs from Christmas Day until Epiphany, which is January 6th, thus the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, so today we will continue the Christmas story. I'm Jonathan Kimball. I'm a ruling elder at First Presbyterian of Church of Rolla, uh, and I will be sharing a message with you today. Now let's prepare our hearts to worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. I will proclaim the gracious deeds of God. The steadfast love of the Lord is great. Now we have seen the saving love of the Lord, the glory of God's people and a light to all. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And now let's pray. Almighty God, you wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of Jesus Christ, who came to share our humanity and who now lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Stop it. 
Please join me in lifting up all of our cares to God. And when I pray, O Christ our light, please respond, hear our prayer. And I will provide space in the prayer for you to share silently whatever's on your heart. And let's pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let us pray for the life of the world, saying, O Christ our light, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. With Mary, help us to treasure and ponder the gift that has been given to us, a gift of good news and great joy for all. O Christ, our light, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. With the prophets, help us to proclaim the promise of your peace for all nations and your justice for all people. O Christ, our light, hear our prayer. We pray for this community. With the shepherds, help us to keep watch over those entrusted to our care and all who need protection this night. O Christ, our light, hear our prayer. We pray for loved ones. With the angels, help us to offer signs of hope, comfort, and joy for all who live in fear. O Christ, our light, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, hope of the world, help us to bear witness to your light so that all may believe and have life in you. In your holy name, we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we'll hear a, a special song written, by, written and performed by Mary Quantas, uh, reminding us that uh, Jesus was not just that baby in the manger, but uh, lived a life of service, ultimately ending on the cross, a life of service to all.
Our New Testament lesson comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. Our gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification, that is, Mary and Joseph, according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that is, Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was seeing, being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why was Jesus born in 4 BC? We often talk about reasons why Jesus was born, period, but less often about the reasons why he was born then and there. He was born at just the right time to change the world. What made it the right time? Well, let's consider the context, Judea in the Roman Empire. Rome was founded in 753 BC became a republic in 509 BC, then a dictatorship in 45 BC under Julius Caesar. By the time of Jesus' birth, Octavian had won the civil war after Julius Caesar's assassination, adopted the title of Caesar Augustus, and established the Roman Empire. This was a great time to be a Roman, and actually not terrible for everyone else. Okay. Augustus's immediate successors, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, they were, they were really awful. I mean, really bad. Um, but under Augustus, and then again under the emperors after Nero, there was stability throughout the empire. There was a common language, Koine Greek, that all of the conquered peoples 
used to communicate. The Romans invested heavily in civic works, including perhaps 63,000 miles of paved roads. Judea was not exactly the crossroads of the world, but was connected to much of the ancient world through Rome's network of roads. The Via Maris ran from Egypt to several Mediterranean ports before crossing Galilee near Capernaum, which was the home base of Jesus' ministry, then east to Damascus and the Silk Road to China. Other roads connected to the north through Asia Minor to Macedonia and Greece. Travel by road was easier then than it had ever been before due to a number of innovations by the Romans, from better engineering to better navigation to better policing. Travel by sea was also becoming more common. The Roman Empire had a shipping network across the eastern Mediterranean to supply the 400,000 tons of wheat needed each year to feed the people of Rome. There weren't any passenger ships per se, but you could buy passage on one of these grain ships. It was a world with more connections than ever in the previous millennium. Rome also had a policy of recruiting soldiers from across the empire and then settling them in various places when they retired, not, not in their hometown, but somewhere else. And that was a, a way of getting everyone to think of themselves as Romans first, sort of an early melting pot. Also helping with travel was the Pax Romana. Other than times when civil war broke out over imperial succession, there was a sort of peace throughout the empire. The Roman army policed the roads, you know, prevented bandits and highwaymen, uh, also prevented rebellions, while also preventing battles between the nations that they had conquered. It was a peace, but not of comfort, but of fear. Judea was one of those conquered nations living not only in fear, but also in righteous anger. The Jewish people knew that they were chosen by God to be a light to the world, but they also knew that they had forsaken God's laws over the preceding centuries. As punishment, they were first exiled, then allowed to live as a client state of a succession of conquering empires. About 200 years before Jesus' birth, messianic expectations began to grow. Now, not everyone, but some Jews began to read the words of the prophets as signs that God would anoint a savior, someone who would restore Israel as God's people. At the beginning of Advent, I spoke about this apocalyptic messianic eschatology, which was the belief that the end was near when a Messiah would reveal God's glory to the world and would reveal the spiritual battle that was raging in which God would be victorious over death and evil. Simeon was just such a person. We read that he was awaiting the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. He knew that the Messiah would come in his lifetime and also that he himself would see the Messiah. He knew that the end of one age was near followed by a messianic age in which everything would be made right with God. He knew that the Messiah would reveal God's light to the world and indeed would be the light of revelation, not only to Israel, but also to the Gentiles. All people would be God's people. When he sees the baby Jesus, Simeon was led by the Holy Spirit. He was devout and attuned to the leading of the Spirit after a lifetime of waiting. He sees in Jesus the glory of Israel. Now, I don't know Greek, I'll admit that, but the word used for glory is doxa. I looked at the other ways Luke uses this same word, doxa. He uses it to describe the glory that surrounds the disciples at the transfiguration. He uses it when speaking of the Son of Man arriving on clouds of glory. And he uses it to describe Jesus after the resurrection. Kind of a theme there, right? He uses it to describe God's presence. 
So Simeon is saying that the baby Jesus is God's salvation, a light for revelation to the world, and the glory, the doxa of Israel. That is, Jesus is God. No wonder Mary and Joseph were amazed at Simeon's pronouncement. We read in Galatians that Jesus was born in the fullness of time, that is, at the right time. Simeon knew that it was the right time. But what made it the right time for God to be revealed in this way? Well, Israel was ready to hear a message of salvation and redemption. The Roman civic works, coupled with the Pax Romana, made travel safer and easier than ever before. People were moving around the empire, so ideas would travel as well. The final piece of the puzzle happened in 70 AD, when Rome destroyed the temple and Judaism was forced to change. What would it mean to be God's people when God no longer had a home on earth in the temple in Jerusalem? Some Jews continued the synagogue traditions that had evolved and created what's now rabbinic Judaism. Others believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah who had ushered in a new age, an age where all people had been redeemed as children of God. Just as the destruction of the temple was the catalyst for fundamental changes in Judaism, ultimately including the creation of Christianity as a distinct religion, I wonder if the COVID-19 pandemic is the catalyst for fundamental changes in all our lives and in all our society. I've been thinking that the pandemic has come at the right time if there ever is such a thing. Consider what impact COVID would have had on society five years ago or 25 years ago or 125 years ago. 25 years ago, for example, the internet existed, okay? And people like me, I, I was an engineering student, a college student. Engineers, college students, business people had access to the internet, but it was slow and really had a limited impact on broader society. Analog cell phones were available, but expensive. Most people relied on what we now call landlines. Since then, we've had an explosion of interconnectedness. Smartphones, Wi-Fi, Facebook, YouTube, online news sources, and so forth. Meanwhile, Amazon has revolutionized shopping. I can get practically anything I want in just a couple days, no matter where in the US I live. The medical field has also made tremendous advances. Remdesivir, the antiviral drug being used to treat COVID, was developed just six years ago to fight Ebola. Not just one, but several new vaccines have been developed in just a few months instead of years. If the pandemic had hit five or 25 years ago, it would have been catastrophic. Okay, it's still going to be devastating. And it has been and will continue to be devastating. But society will survive. What comes out the other side, though, won't be the same as what it was before. A friend of mine was talking about how rested and relaxed she feels. She has three kids, all in multiple sports and other extracurricular activities. Because of their ages, rarely are they on the same team or in the same club or, uh, or in the same organization. So her whole family is on the run all the time to different practices and meetings and events and so forth. During the pandemic, most or all of that has stopped. So they can just be a family in the evening. When things open up again, will they get back in the rat race? Uh, probably, but they might be a little bit more selective about uh, which things they, uh, they take back up. I think a lot of the activities themselves won't, won't come back at all because schools and organizations will decide that they can accomplish the same things in different ways. When life is disrupted, we focus first on fundamentals, food, water, shelter. Just as important though, we all need connections to each other 
and connections to God. But we don't have to satisfy those needs in the same way we always have. We have all learned to have more takeout or delivery instead of dining in restaurants. Walmart is doing a booming business in grocery pickup. We even have DoorDash in Rolla now. So when I was writing the sermon, I, I discovered that I can get free delivery of Odagis or soda and scoops. Huh. That's kind of cool. We all have to eat, but we don't have to leave home to do it. In the same way, we all need to love and be loved by our neighbors and to worship God. But what will that look like after the pandemic? I think it starts by going back to our fundamental principles. Jesus gave his mission statement in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That was Jesus' mission while he was on earth, and as Christ's body, that is the mission of the church today. As Presbyterians, we look to the Book of Order for more specific direction. In G1.0101, the Book of Order says, Through the congregation, God's people carry out the ministries of proclamation, sharing the sacraments, and living in covenant life with God and each other. We are to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to baptize in the name of the Trinity, to celebrate Holy Communion, and to live as God's people. It doesn't say that our job is to put butts in seats or dollars in the plate, which is good, because neither one's going to happen for a while. Right? Even, even once people start coming to in-person worship, uh, we can't be passing around these uh, plate, you know, collection plates that people are fondling and uh, coughing on and, and have, what have you. But that's not our job, right? While it's nice to be in the sanctuary, God doesn't live there any more than anywhere else. We can be Christ's body wherever we are living together in covenant life, proclaiming good news to the poor. I have a lot of thoughts about what the church of the future might look like, but I'll save those for another day, if only because they're, they're probably wrong. Okay, I've got a lot more questions than answers. And I have, I have more ideas about what the future won't be than about what it will be. I will be praying over the coming weeks, months, and probably years for God to guide me just as the Holy Spirit guided Simeon towards a new way of being a part of the body of Christ. I would ask everyone to do the same. The only certainty about the future is that it will be different. And it is up to us, with God's help, to make the future better than the past. As we consider the future of our congregation, of PCUSA, and indeed of Christianity, we must distinguish between what is essential and what is superficial. Simeon knew what was essential. Jesus is God's salvation. Jesus is a light for revelation to us all. Jesus is glory for God's people. Let us live into a future where we hold fast to the hope that was born in Jesus more than two millennia ago, in a future where we shine forth his light to the world. Amen. Savior of the world.
rise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Alleluia. Go now and bear witness to the light of Christ. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Alleluia. Amen.